Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We have just sung the picture of the supper that we now come to celebrate. I'm going to ask if you would, if you don't have a sermon outline, to just lift your hand and um, turn uh, to these guys that are in the center, and they would be glad to give you one. This morning we want to look at the glorious centrality of Christ. We have just sung about it, the name that is above all names, the one that is the one who has come to rule and to reign over sin and to de- over death. And this morning we come to remember where we see this in Scripture in one of the most precious and glorious passages of Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. It's often been a joke um, that uh, if you're at church, and especially for kids, or maybe even for adults, when a question is asked in a Sunday school class, what is usually the safe answer? Okay, many of you know that. Usually the safe answer is Jesus. You know, it's almost like over the last hundred years, whenever questions ask, you know, um, who is the, is the name that is above all names? Jesus. Who is the one who can pay for our sins or has paid for our sins on the cross? It's Jesus. You know, who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? It's Jesus. We, we talk about the name of Jesus. We have even made uh, reference to that in a humorous way that Jesus is the center of everything. Jesus is the answer to everything. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a great song that it was a, one of the choruses that came along that said, you know, what is the, uh, the need of the world? It said, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Um, great, great chorus that is there. Well, this morning we want to look and see a passage of Scripture that captures that. Um, If you're new to the life of our church, usually what we seek to do is, this is how we study the Bible, we read a phrase and then we explain it, we read a phrase and then we explain it, and not merely to explain it, but to also to receive its message and to understand what it says. The whole Bible is understandable. Every person here in this room can read the Bible and begin to understand it through the power of the Holy Spirit and through discipline of study. And so this morning we come to do that. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of a background on this passage because it's so good and it'll help you to understand where it comes from. Notice the screen in front of you in this beautiful town that's here at the base of a very large mountain. In fact, this town is modern day Colossae or Colossae of Turkey. It is in Turkey. In the ancient world, you see a map here that kind of shows the Mediterranean Sea and what is uh, Turkey in that day. I want you to see there's two towns that were very close together, and here's a reason for this. There's Ephesus and there's the town of Colossae. You see both of those towns. They're separated by about 100 miles, so not very, very far of a distance. But I want you to notice on your outline here, below the box that we're about to read uh, the Scripture, I want you to see this background story of Colossians. And um, I want you to see in this little paragraph um, the real setup for what we're about to study as we look at God's Word this morning. First of all, Paul spent three years in that town of Ephesus. So Ephesus was nearby to Colossae, and he spent three years there. A guy named Epaphras, Epaphras from the nearby city of Colossae, heard and believed the gospel. So this guy came through Ephesus. He heard Paul preaching. Somehow he came to faith in Jesus. Well, notice this. Epaphras went home but began preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ. A church in Colossae was established. Eventually, Paul moved to Rome. About five years later, Epaphras came to visit Paul and told him that dangerous teaching, underline that, dangerous teaching had come into the church at Colossae. The exact nature of the false teaching is not known, but it was dangerous and destructive. And we know from in the letter it was seeking to exalt spirituality, angelic powers, and even sensuality. Paul writes this powerful letter that declares, and underline these three things, Christ as the only exalted Savior over all things. So he's he's exalting Christ. And then he's doing this. He calls the Colossian believers 
to hold fast, underline that, to hold fast, to shed sinful practices from their culture around them. So the sinful practices of the culture around them were making its way into the lives of this, these believers and the life of this church. Shed those sinful practices. And to look at the third one, underline this, to cultivate Christian virtues in their lives. And so that's what Colossians is all about. It's saying, hey, all these other spiritual powers and these angel powers, these are not the center. Christ is the center. And in fact, the culture that's around you, don't be like the culture around you. Come and take on the virtues of Christ. Take on the virtues of Christ in their lives. Now, notice this paragraph that's below this. Chapter 1 Verses 15 through 20 says this, they are a powerful poetic declaration of Christ's lordship over creation, fill that in, over creation and redemption. That's what these verses that we're going to study are, are like. And they're, they're a bit of a poem. They don't look like a poem uh, in the form that we have here or even in the rhyme and the reason of English. But if you look at Koine Greek, and if you look at the way it progresses, they appear to be a poem, and they appear to be made in an artful way. But notice this, it may even be that they are an early Christian hymn. So this morning as we look at this declaration about the centrality of Christ, it appears that this may have been sung by the early church. Not all of the letter of Colossians, but verses 15 through 20 appear to have maybe been a hymn that they would sing. And so let's read this, and we're going to move very quickly through it this morning as we look at the centrality of Christ. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word now. I pray, Lord, that your word would grip our hearts. Lord, I pray that wherever we are rebellious against any of these truths, Lord, that we would break our will, that you would break our will, and that it would be submitted to you that we may walk in life and in truth. And so, Jesus, I ask that you would speak now to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Look at verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the speaking of Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then I've underlined verse 18 for us to remember as a church as we come to the table this morning. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, curious phrase, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Would you underline that last phrase as well, making peace by the blood of his cross. We need to remember how God made peace and who this one was who made peace by the blood of his cross. Peace with God and peace with man. This is the picture of what God has done for his people, those who have come to Christ. Well, let's remember who this Christ is. Number one, I want you to see that in Christ, these verses show us that all God's personality is seen in Christ. You want to know who God is? Come and see the person of Christ. You say, well, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Yes, that is exactly right. Three persons in one. But we, and we recognize that not all three of them are exactly the same, but they are one God. And so while they are equal in their importance and equal in their deity, 
We see that in Christ we see the heart of the Father and we see the heart of the Spirit. We see the whole picture of who he is and his personage in the picture of the beloved Christ. I want you to notice this, and we see it in verse 15. First of all, he is the image of the invisible God. What does that mean? Now, notice that it says, and this is letter A there, he's not an image of God. He's not an image. He's the image of God. And that's what it says in verse 15. He is the image. We just circle the word the up there in the box on the top of the page. He is the image of the invisible God. It's not an image. This is the one. The next bullet point that you see there is he's not merely a reflection. So when it's talking about an image, it's not merely a reflection, but a manifestation of God. This is God made manifest. This is God showing up. This is God. And so we see that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What does this mean? Letter B, the firstborn of all creation. Now, don't be confused. This has nothing to do with chronology. This isn't progression in time. Now, that's very often what we think of um, in our society today. We don't think very much about the age-old views of firstborn, having the first birthright, and having the, the, the first role in the family and in the lineage. We often think of just order of birth. But that is not the picture that is here. It's not merely chronology. It's far more than that. It has everything to do, keyword, to priority. This has everything to do with priority. And I want you to think of Eastern lineage. Think of the heir to the rulership. This is the right to rule. And that, make that a note out there to the side, the right to rule. That's what this is about. This is talking about the fact that Christ has the right to rule over all things as being the firstborn from the dead. And the picture is this, that he's the firstborn, excuse me, of all creation. Later he talks about the firstborn from the dead. But this is the one who has the right to rule. Now, in these current days, we see Queen Elizabeth and her interesting son Charles, and then we see the two sons. I'm not going to make any more comment about that, but uh, then we see the two sons. And what are the two sons' names? The first one is William, and what's the second one? What is it? Okay, you got it. So, William, it's very interesting that you, you don't very much hear about Harry um, only because he married uh, an American model and, th and that kind of thing. You, you kind of hear about that, and, and you, you hear about the baby being born recently, and there's been some cool things about that, and it's very, very sweet. Um, but it's so interesting how he's quickly dismissed as he is not in line to the throne. It's William, and William is the one who will be king, become king of England. So it appears. And so here's, here's part of what we see here. It's the right to rule. It's the idea of an Eastern lineage, of this idea of a, of a right to rule. And we see this throughout the Scripture, that the firstborn of all creation, he is the one who rules over all creation. And the next verses are going to make that very clear. But look at Psalm 89, verse 27, at the bottom of your page. It says, and I will make him the firstborn. And then here it is, emphasizing the key issue here, the highest of the kings of the earth. Now, this is pointing toward the gift of God of the Davidic king, of David being king. But we see as so many things in the Old Testament that it's an image of the things to come. And as we see in Psalm 89, we see in Psalm 22, we see throughout the Psalms that this is, this is really pointing toward a greater king. This is pointing toward the fulfillment of of the Davidic covenant that would eventually give way to the new covenant that we celebrate even this morning. But this picture of God promising a king that would rule under his authority and ultimately pointing to the glorious Christ. Notice here at the bottom of the page, you need to remember when we look at the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, do you remember Jesus' words from John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen what? The Father. 
And so here we're seeing that Jesus is God. This one that we come to recognize in this passage is God the Father. And it's made even more clearly as we come to the second page there as we look at verse 16. Would you please look at verse 16 in the box at the top of the page? For by him all things were, circle the word, created. Remember we said that he's talking about creation and he's talking about redemption. So here's the section that's really looking at creation. Once again, firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So whether earthly powers or spiritual powers that can't be seen. This is talking about the demonic world and the angelic world. You see, this came up because the Colossian people were being confused about the spiritual world around them. False teaching had come in, causing them to wonder, are we supposed to be worshiping angels? What about these issues of demons? What, what, what's going on with all this? There's obviously a spiritual world that's going beyond. And so some of the teachings that Epaphras shows up and t- tells Paul about is they're, they're confusing the superiority, they're confusing the supremacy of Christ with other spiritual things. So this is, we got to get this straight and we got to get it clear. And this is very important for us in 2019 as well because we have culture coming at us. We have spirituality coming at us. We have much interest all around us in the occult. We have much interest all around us in all the spiritual things. And if you read what the Bible says is going to happen as the time draws near for the return of Christ and to the next era to give way, we are going to see that there's going to be all kinds of people that are deceived about spiritual things, and they take their eyes off the creator of all things, and they start to look at other spiritual beings. So the warnings given to the people 2,000 years ago in Colossae are very important for Sheridan Hills Baptist Church and you as you live your life. We need to see the centrality of Christ. And that's what this is showing us. So look at verse 16 again. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is, look what it says in verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So, number two is this. We see all God's power is seen in Christ. All of God's power is seen in Christ. Now, the first thing that we see here, letter A, he created the universe. Look at verse 16, and I put it right below this phrase where you're writing created. He created the universe. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. This is the picture of all things in the universe. Look at the next part. Not only did he create all things, but look at verse 16b. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Not only did he create the universe, but he claims the universe. He claims the universe as his. He is the authority over the universe. He is the owner of it all. Look at letter C. Verse 17 it says... And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What this means is he controls the universe. So he created the universe, he claims the universe, he is the authority over it, and he controls it. Everything holds together by his power. Now, I believe that this is not only speaking of figuratively, that the whole world stays together and things kind of continue by him and his prevenient grace over us or his common grace over us. But listen to this. It's even more than that. I believe at the atomic level, it is God in his power that is holding together the universe. He created the atomic power of every atom in every every tinier and tinier and tinier picture of our physical substance. And we discover when you split an atom, what happens? Can you say kaplowy? I mean, we're talking power. 
right? Boom, kaboom, whatever it is that in the Marvel picture. I mean, we start to see that there is power in this. All things hold together. Everything holds together by his hand. And the scripture says that when this era is over and he's ready to wipe this out in order to establish a new heaven and a new earth, the scripture is very clear that it will be done not by flood, but by intense heat. And so the picture is he holds all things together by his power. And when he is ready to release that power in order to create the new heaven and new earth, which the scripture says will happen, he will release it. And there will be a total obliteration of what we see in these. So he holds together everything by his power. This is the power of God, and it is seen in the one who showed up, born of a virgin, cradled in his his mother's arm, and brought into life as this picture of God's love and his humility and his grace and his patience and his kindness, his forbearance and his sacrifice and all that we see in the person of Christ. And so to the point where he would be nailed to a cross, laid down in a tomb, and then overcoming the thing that seems to be so so impossible to overcome, even death itself, because he has the power of God. So look at this, number three. Not only the power of God, but we see in these verses the purposes of God. The purposes of God. Notice in verse 18, I want you to notice this, and this is in the box on your page um, that is up there. It's underlined it and then it's bold. Verse 18, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church. So this is all of God's family. Christ is the head of it. And why is he the head of it? Because he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Again, that picture of priority over all others. He overcomes death, so he is the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. That means first, superior. And so we want, you to, we want to see this together. Look at number three, if you haven't already filled it in. All God's purposes are seen in Christ. So here it is. Number, letter A, Christ has absolute sovereignty or authority over all things. He is the head of the body, the church. Now, the only thing that really matters going into eternity is God and his people. You know, if you haven't figured it out, you can't take anything with you out of this life. There is no stamp collection. There is no piece of electronics. There are no pictures of your children. There are nothing that is going to leave, not even the stitchings that cover your body. You're going to leave in your birthday suit. It's going to be gone. And I, we, we are going to stand before God, and the only thing that is going to matter is whether or not we are His. That is the only thing that will matter. So the thing that will go into eternity is people, and in people there will either be the Word of God that has saved them through the message and the work of Christ, or there will be the coming to terms with a holy God as a sinful person with no covering. And that means condemnation for eternity, separation from God. God made a plan. He made the plan in order to save us. It is Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Don't get mad at me. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. And you can either come to terms with that and by his grace to believe upon that, or you can reject that. This is the picture. He is the head of the body, the church. If the church is saved, which when we're talking about the true church of God, the true people of God, the reason that he's the head of the church is he saved the church with his life. He bought them with his life. These are the blood-bought humans that God has brought for himself and bought for himself through the person of Christ. So he has authority over those who are going to live in eternity with him. Letter B, not only does he have, authority, does he have absolute sovereignty, but he has absolute supremacy. 
He is supreme over all. That means he is the ultimate. He, is the, he goes beyond any other rival. There is nothing else that rivals him. He is, notice what it says here, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is the supreme being of all beings, and he calls us into a relationship with him. And so here we see, number one, he originates life. From him, life comes. And not only does he originate life, but here's the amazing part about the redeeming gospel. He overcomes death. That's why it's such a big deal that Jesus rose from the dead. Not only does he institute life as a possibility, we fall into our sin, we reject him, and he comes back and he says, here is the grand second chance. And the grand second chance is my salvation coming to pay for your sin and overcome your death so you can join me in life. And he has the supremacy to be able to do that. Look, notice verse 19. Would you look up at the top of the page, verse 19? For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Can you put a little line out there to the side by the word was on the right-hand side? Philippians 2. Because it's in Philippians 2, which we often quote, is this picture that God comes in Christ Jesus to the world. And he comes being completely God, not not holding on to his right to remain in heaven and be in that celestial state, but he comes to us in human form. And this is all of God coming to be pleased to dwell with us in human form. So, let us see, when we see who this is that's coming to pay for our sins, he is absolutely sufficient. We see the sufficiency of Christ, the absolute sufficiency of Christ. He is completely sufficient to do what has to be done in paying for our sins. You see, here's part of the idea. I can't pay for your sins because I'm a sinner. David can't pay for your sins because David's a sinner. Just ask his mom and dad, they'll tell you all about it. I mean, you say, that's terrible. And I'm looking back there at Adrian Castellano. Adrian's a sinner. Adrian, Adrian's a gusto guy, loves Jesus, got saved a couple of years ago. His life has been changed, trying to be no-nonsense Christian. I mean, he's going for it. But you know, anything that he has that he's going for, it's all because Jesus gave it to him. He understands that. He loves that. He embraces that. But Adrian, as zealous as he is, he cannot pay for anyone's sin in this room because he's a sinner. The big deal about Jesus coming to pay for our sins is he is the only one that was sufficient. He was the only sinless sacrifice that can properly pay for our sins. So, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. This was God coming to pay for sins. Look at letter D. Christ gave absolute sacrifice. And we see this in verse 20. I want you to look at verse 20. Look what it says. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, and then as we underlined, making peace by the blood of his cross. You see, he is the absolute sacrifice. So when he lays down his life through the cruel cross of his condemnation, the Father pours out his wrath on the Son. This is God pouring out his wrath on himself so that he may save us from our sins. So, it's in Christ that we see power. It's in Christ that we see purpose. In Christ we see the personality of God and the love of God. And God is saying, look to me. You're going to see love. Now, these last two blanks that are here are very important, and I do not want you to fold up the page until I encourage you to do that. And it's just because I don't want you to miss this. 
In Colossians 2, in Ephesians 2, in 1 Peter, we see that Jesus takes our sin and he humbly goes to the cross as the innocent lamb of God. This is the lamb that is defenseless. This is the lamb that is the most gentle of creatures. This is the perfect lamb of God that's laying down his life for his people. And he takes our sins upon himself. And these verses describe the fact that our sins are nailed to the cross when the lamb is nailed to the cross. This is the son of God being nailed to the cross for us. Now, you fr friends, this is the picture of reconciling grace. This is God reconciling us to himself by his grace. But it's not only by his grace that we see who God is in Christ, but in these other passages of Scripture, in 1 Corinthians 15, in Revelation 19, in Revelation 20, we see a fierce and awesome warrior. This fierce and awesome warrior executes his judgment upon all who have sinned against him. And so we see that the lamb becomes the great warrior that judges sin. And the wrath that was not poured upon, poured upon Christ because of your sin not being forgiven is poured out upon you. And God judges that. In fact, in Revelation, we see that this Christ comes and his robe is dripping with the blood of his enemies because he has slain them. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very sweet. That doesn't sound very nice. Well, that, that reminds us of why his sacrifice is so important. This reminds us of the awesome Lord that lays down his life and says, come. All who are willing, come. Come and see that I will forgive. Friends, today as we take these elements, we remember that Christ has indeed died for those who are his children, that he has indeed come to pay for their sins and to give them the grace to live for him in a fallen world. May we recognize his reconciling grace and may we run to him that we do not see the judgment account being reconciled against us, that it is indeed Christ who reconciles our sin debt and takes it upon himself. So, the glorious centrality of Christ is what the church needs to see. In your own Christian life, you need to see that it's all in Christ. He's everything, not only creator and sustainer, but he's the redeemer that comes and says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These are the words of the Savior who says, come and believe. Come and receive. Come and receive me. It's not your goodness. It's not the church's goodness. It's not the moving worship service. It's not the great orator or something like that. It is all based upon Jesus and what he has done. Amen? Let's pray together.